<laughs> All right. So I guess we're set. It looks like it's starting with Caitlin. Another it container is, escape. We have yet another container escape, which is what everyone was afraid of once Docker became popular. It's like, what if we could escape the container? Um, and this is not only just a, a container escape, this is a privileged container escape. So you just get out of the container and then you, you know, can take over the system. That's awesome. Um, and so the way this works is it uses a, a function called a release agent. And you just have to guess some uh, process IDs. And you do that. And you can essentially get out of the privileged container. I'm sort of glad to see this because I remember years ago when containers first came out, they said they're really not very secure and, you, and virtual machines are more secure. And yet I wasn't convinced. But now this, this helps justify that attitude. Yeah, they're definitely not as secure as virtual machines. But, um, you know, just keep your software up to date. Uh, just understand that, you know, they're, they're not completely walled off from the host operating system like a virtual machine is. But even in virtual machines, there are still ways to escape. If you, you know, get on a virtual machine and then you can sometimes pivot onto the host machine now that you're in the network and stuff. So Now, you always run containers as root, don't you? I've never seen them run any other way. I have no, yeah, I've never seen containers run as, as users. That um, would seem like a good move. <laughs> you would think. Yeah. I but think it, I don't know. I think Docker lets you run in anything other than a super user. Yeah, I've, I tried running it as, as other users, and I just yeah. didn't have much, much luck with that. There was actually a story that came out today about, the, about uh, uh, EXSI, uh, a major EXSI vulnerability uh, that... Uh, VMware just released a patch for, so yeah. they were able to escape to the host system. Yeah, yeah, well, they happen, yeah. And then I thought this was super handy. Here's the certifications you should all get. 366 information security certifications, all gathered together for your convenience. So, you know, don't bother applying for a job until you have all these. And I thought- Every you know, last one. What's that? Every last one. That's right, and so, you know, the guy that posted this, Richard Bentley, he said, you know, there's something wrong with our field when it produces nonsense like this. Like, how is any human ever supposed to, like, gain any level of competence in all this junk? Anyway, that's why I thought this was kind of funny. And, uh, of course, that's why you need lists like this. Like, here's five, right? That's more like it. <laughs> you know, right. go through that garbage. And find the, I know, like, you can't tell somebody – there's the 300 things wrong with you that you have to fix right away. They'll just give up and quit. <laughs> you have to get it down to the top five or something. Anyway, but this is, uh, this is crazy. You know, first thing I thought when I saw this is clearly you need a robot to do this. You need an AI machine that has all 366 certifications, not a human. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, too, is, there, is that there's a lot of grifters in InfoSec that just are out to make a buck. And if they can create a new shirt that they can sell to people, then they'll do it. Well, I suppose there's some of that, but I, uh, I quite, I've heard of quite a few of these. I, I think most of them actually reflect knowledge of a useful skill. It's like the attack matrix with its 278 techniques, each of which could be like a whole course in itself. There really is that much information. Yeah. yeah right. I'm not, I'm not saying that they're, that they're scamming people, but I'm just saying that there's incentives to create, you know, create all these courses to, you know, target industries and get money from them. Well, yeah, yeah. But I, I think the other thing to say is that even if you hire like a big professional security staff, you're not even covering half of the attack vectors. You'll never get up to covering half of them. But what we really need is instead of, of trying to get people up to date and know all this stuff, just yeah. make it really easy to look up what you need. Yeah, well, it's, I guess it's... um. Just like the attack matrix, like you don't really need to have a cert to know like what every single APT is doing or whatever. You can just learn how to use the, the attack matrix and then know what to do. And I feel like that is what we should be focusing on instead of trying to like have all these certifications. Yeah, it is. Uh, this, this just shows that people don't really know what they're doing yet. They don't know what to focus on. Nope. And uh, anyway. Well, I mean, I know what to focus on. We've got this uh, offensive security, the OSCP. That's true. I mean, and that's why you tell students, go to the top 10, get some of these. That'll guide you. Yep. But if you're like a security manager at a corporation saying, all right, what are all the threats and how are we blocking them all? Both of those are far more difficult questions than they ought to be. Oh, yeah. Anyway, 
And so JARM, what the heck is JARM? <laughs> um, so I thought this was interesting. It's just a, it's a tool that essentially uh, leverages TLS fingerprinting to provide, to um, find uh, malicious servers. Um, it was just kind of a cool implementation, I thought. Um, they they did a little research and found it was pr a pretty effective way to find uh, find um, malicious servers because a lot of the time they'll spin up a bunch of different threat actors will spin up a bunch of different ones um, using the same um, um, and, then, and then they'll have the same uh, certificate. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a thought. Yeah, you could use your certificate to identify malicious ones. Yep. And I thought that I just thought it was a cool approach. Now yeah, you got yeah. to do, you there. They did get the occasional false positive. So just with, with any automated tool, you still got to do, um, you still got to do manual verification. But uh, it was overall pretty effective. It looked like in in the research tests. You know, this is another area of security that is really far from settled. I was teaching TLS last night. And the textbook said you should use certificate pinning. And I had improved my slides a year ago by saying certificate pinning is now deprecated and you're supposed to use this other thing. And a student asked, how does that thing work? And I said, well, I don't even know how it works. I just know what the name is. So I Googled it. And now they said, no, that thing's already shot. We've invented another one. Right. <laughs> Remember, certificate pinning, they pushed and pushed and pushed it. And it started rising from like 0% to 2% to 5%. And then they said, oh, forget it, it's worthless. And it kept rising to 10 and 15. Right. <laughs> Developers and security administrators must be going nuts. They say, look, will you guys just make up your mind and tell me what to do so I could do it and then not tell me to undo it next year? You know, like, anyway. Right. Well, it's, that's why we're in the business. It's, it's an exciting business. Everything keeps changing. You would and think, for example, that the mathematics would hold still, but no. And we never learn, run out of stuff to learn either. No, not, you can always get another 300 certifications if you get bored. I mean, right. that's the great thing about the field is that it's, you always have to learn. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can just kind of go off on your own project as long as it relates to your work and just yeah. study that for a while. I mean, it's, it's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, but you really have to like that, that sort of constant learning. This is the young period in science when you're just discovering stuff and enumerating what it all is without having to worry about all the details. Like when you're exploring a jungle, finding new insects and stuff. Anyway, this is uh, Irvin. Oh yes, uh, oh, Apple is still delaying their their what they call the ATT thing, the yeah. app tracking transparency, which would tell you or uh, ask you for permission to send information. They're blaming Facebook, and Facebook is blaming them back. So it's just back and forth, uh, finger pointing. How does Facebook? This. Get involved. The point I knew was that every time you open an app, it sends the fingerprint app to to Apple to decide if that's an okay app, right? Well, no, no. This is more than that. Oh. This is more usage data than than just you're running an app. Oh, app. yeah. This is this is on the on mobile. Oh, oh! It keeps track of everything you do on your phone. Yeah, yeah. So Facebook is doing a lot of it, and Apple say, "No, we're we're gonna roll it out, but uh, point the finger at Facebook first that they need to fix up their act so that we can fix ours. Well, I think it's a big issue. You know, the way everybody keeps pushing this out, I wonder if there's some huge reason why they have to monitor the performance so closely on the phone. Are they just doing it to track to serve you with ads or do you really have to do this to make your phone network work? Right, right. Which to me, the second question, I, my thinking is the answer is no. You don't necessarily need all that for your phone to work. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely a great data mine. It was Carrier IQ, was the original one Apple did, and then they took it off when everyone got mad at them. Yep. I know Android does it like crazy. Every time I set a proxy on my Android phone, you see all this junk coming off it. Mm hmm Anyway. Yeah, well, we'll see what comes with all. Then PlayStation scams. Already. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this, I mean, there's nothing really new in this article um you know basically yeah there's people fishing and you know trying to set up fake stores and trying to get you to buy playstations under the you know um on things like craigslist but then not delivering stuff like that but w what's interesting now is that 
every major launch now is now have all these cyber now has all these cybersecurity issues surrounding it. And so in this case, the PlayStation 5, of course, just just released and there's a bunch of scalpers trying to hoard it and you know sell it at, at huge markups. And um, it, it's creating this market where just crime is going wild. And it's like we really need to figure out ways that we can release these big products and not have it turn into a um, into a threat for the general public. Well, obviously, you should release a new cryptocurrency with every product. That would solve everything. Oh, a blockchain, a PlayStation 5 blockchain. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that would be the answer. Then you register the genuine thing on the blockchain, and everyone can verify that the fake one is fake or something. Remember, that's one of the things you keep saying about blockchain. You're going to register all the artwork and all the domain names and everything on the blockchain and exactly how this is going to help you is not clear, but somehow that's going to solve all the problem. Um, it, it, I, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, Afio uh, can help us out with this, figure out right. the play, PlayStation 5. I don't know. So I thought this was pretty good. Um, you know, just sort of like the, uh, the villains around the turn of the century, the coal mines, the, um, these guys at Tyson were, there's some weird noise. Anyway. Oh, I think it's, I think it's Appio. It's Appio. What's Appio? Uh, look at the, look at all, everyone in the chat, Sam. There's someone named Appio. Oh, there is someone named Appio. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. Appio is going to help us with the PlayStation. No, I understand. Five. All right. Well, I will. Yeah, there we are. All right. Mute. Anyway, hey. I, found the, I found the mute. Good. Okay, good. I thought it was something to do with the PlayStation when you said Appio. So, anyway, these guys uh, with Tyson, th this is one of the plants where they were um, doing nothing to protect the workers and they were all getting coronavirus. And uh, so they continued to just tell them everything is fine, protect the managers, and then they would just bet on how many of them would get sick every week. So it's just like the heartless coal mining engineers and all the other people in the days before there were any unions or worker safety or anything. So anyway, it's interesting to see and hope and they're getting sued. So hopefully there will be some punishment and some accountability here. But I know the Trump administration just declared these guys essential workers and said they had to work and you did not need to provide them any safety or anything. And I think that's why we never got the second stimulus because the Republicans demanded that you insure all the companies against lawsuits so they can get the people sick and they won't have to pay anything. And the Democrats were unwilling to do that, so they decided to just not give anybody anything. Anyway, maybe something will change on January 20 if we actually get a new president, which is not entirely clear right now. Anyway. We survived to January 20th. Well, I think we can by hiding. <laughs> that, that's true. Everything is shutting down in a hurry. Anyway, it is uh, pretty outrageous. As the authority figures are totally not cooperating very much with us getting through this. Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, so uh, I was not at all surprised to read about this uh, on any level. Um, so essentially, uh, hackers figured out a way to uh, exploit uh, the Facebook Messenger app on Android. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and what I thought was funny about this was uh, that they, they described the art right there, they described it as uh, being difficult to exploit, which yeah. really, really not so much. Once you read the, condi once you read the conditions uh, that you need to be operating under to be successful, uh, not that difficult to, uh, to exploit because a lot of people, um, I would say even most users, uh, leave both of those logged in all the time. Um, and what I thought was really crazy about this was that um, you could call a user um, on uh, Messenger and they wouldn't even need to, the, the target wouldn't even need to pick up the call for it to happen. The, the uh, hacker would be able to listen to them just as it was listen to what was happening um, through their the microphone on their device uh, just as the call was ringing. So uh, yeah. I thought it was pretty interesting. There was one like this maybe two years ago in class. I remember we read about it and Caitlin and I tried it like in the lab. Uh, I think on my iPhone, you could, you could, you could totally FaceTime. listen to it like, a, uh, like yeah. a microphone, like two years yeah. ago. Yeah, FaceTime. Um, yeah. FaceTime. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. 
In fact, they refer to it in this article. Yeah. Well, I guess it's just going to keep happening. That's like the ultimate paranoid thing. Everyone says they're listening through my phone, and I guess they could be. Yeah. All right. And then we got network layer DDoS. Right. You skipped one. I skipped one? Oh, let's see. Oh, I did. Good. Okay. Oh, carrier lock phones. Okay. Yeah. Good. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, phones me... may be finally carrier free. So you can move, you move your phone about, yeah, right? I thought they already were. I thought Obama said you couldn't, no. you had to unlock a phone on request now. You uh, On I request, so too. Yeah. but this is by default. Yeah. yeah. By default, okay. they'll also, be. Yeah, and also they're, uh, they can still require, they can still require, uh, it to be locked for X amount of time if it's a subsidized phone? Well, this is what I thought. They're now required to let you switch networks, although apparently maybe exceptions, but now every phone is going to have just a control panel setting to switch to other carriers? Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. The idea is that you can take the phone, you can take the phone wherever you want. Without having to go like send it back or something. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, it sounds good, but that hasn't happened yet. They're just talking about it, right? It hasn't happened yet. It happened in the UK. Mm -hmm. So the hope is that if it happened in the UK, that'll happen here too. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly would be simpler. All right. And then we got the network layer DDoS. Yes, I like data. I very much like data. So Cloudflare mm -hmm. released a bunch of data on DDoS attacks uh, in the past year. And so there's some interesting data points that I'm not so quite sure why this is like, you're looking at one right now, like it, September for some reason has like 30% of all the DDoS attacks. Why but, September? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's baffling. What's that this? is baffling. Yep. And then you have, uh, you know, attack size <laughs> and bit rates and stuff like that. Um, and some things of course are you, you expect like um, most of the attacks are SIN, TCP SIN attacks. You have a few, you know, resets and stuff like that. Some um, big event happened in September, I think. Or I don't think so. I don't remember anything. August, August 91%? Then yeah. nothing in September? Yeah. Anyway, um, attacks by country. So in the United States, about 20% of all, all DDoS comes from us, um, followed by Germany with 3.9%. Um, and you can actually go around the world and you can see that in Africa, most uh, DDoS attacks come from South Africa. Mm. Um, and of course, Australia is a big one, bigger than India. You would think there would be more DDoS attacks coming from India, but no, Australia mm. and Japan are the, are the big ones. And Thailand, apparently. Thailand, Australia, and Japan. Wow. Um, and of course, in, in, in Europe, it's pretty much all Germany. And then like Russia has like half that amount of Germany. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> California's number one, I see. Yep, California's number one. We are always number one, uh, followed by Texas. Uh, well, yeah, I that's guess what I would figure. Yeah, yeah, which is, has a large population, so that makes sense. And then Virginia, that actually might be the government. <laughs> that might be the NSA, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, lots of interesting stuff. And then some blurb for cloud players saying they want to, you can, we can protect you. But yeah, yeah. I just love data. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's good to see. Reminds me of the Verizon uh, threat report. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm losing my mind. Right, so we're down to wi these Wi-Fi routers six. I just heard about this. Kirk told me just a few days ago. There's yet another Wi-Fi protocol in these new routers for sale, and boy, there sure are. Um, 802.11xz or something. Uh, AX. 802.11ax is apparently uh, even faster. We jump from AC to AD to now the AX. Apparently so. Um, well, no, that that's not entirely true. So what happened is that we. Um, they want to start rebranding it into into terms that make sense because no one can remember 802.11 AAC or 802.11 N. So now it says Wi-Fi 6. So well, yeah. Wi but the technical protocol, of course, is anyway. So this oh, our students will get, will get quizzed on the 802.11. Everyone else will know it as Wi-Fi 6. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it's 10 gigabits per second, apparently. Which... Uh, cool. But how you don't have the internet that fast. But anyway, that's anyway you can buy them for a couple hundred bucks. They say this thing is good, but it's a giant beast the size of a dinner plate. Which and and uh, anyway, these things are available for a few hundred bucks now. 
looks like you need eight antennas now. <laughs> so it really is getting kind of nuts. I mean, I, I have one for AC, um, but I, I also live in an old house with um, very thick walls. So my Wi-Fi is ridiculous because <laughs> I, I also can't run wires because I'm renting. So my yep. wife is ridiculous and has like... Power, power line networking is often the answer then. I, I don't trust the power lines in this house. Well, you don't have to trust them. You can put a password on your power line network. Well, well no, no, I mean, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the power uh, factor and quality. In fact, even yeah. the, in my room, my ground wire is not connected as it should be. I have an open ground on my outlets and stuff, so I'm just like, no, I'm not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <it's always that. laughs> sure, but you could be sending data through it. It would be fine. Like I said, it's not the data, it's not the security, it's the fires and... <laughs> well, well, why is the wall warm? Huh. Well, if you're going to be like that, yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, I mean, why... Don't be a stick in the mud. Fry your devices today. Well, you know. <laughs> you know, it's time to buy new stuff anyway. Yeah, there you go. That's a good attitude. <laughs> I mean, Just don't yeah, use it during inclement weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've I've set up power line before. It is awesome. I just don't trust it with a hundred year old wiring. I actually oh. did fry a modem like that during a thunderstorm in the Midwest once. Yeah. And now we, we got IoT cybersecurity law. Wait a minute. What is this garbage? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, it is sort of what, what you just said. Um, I thought it was interesting because so these three these three articles are all related in that it's yet another round of folks legislating things that they just don't understand. Um, and essentially, the upshot is all of this is it's it's a hand wave to NIST, which is come up with standards, uh, and then we're going to start evaluating stuff. So. These are of varying degrees of value. I mean, I think the IoT one's not, not a bad, it's a step in the right direction, I mean, to get some standardization going for that. Um, and basically all they're talking about right now is making sure that IoT um, devices that the government purchases and implements uh, meet whatever these uh, standards are gonna be. Um, the, oh, it, doesn't, it only affects the ones purchased by the government, okay. Right, right. But I, the reason it's a, that, that's, and that's why I said that whatever the, the government purchases to use, but it's good in that uh, there is no existing set of standards. And so this, co this is going to trigger uh, NIST to generate them. And, you know, it's, a, it's baby steps. It's a first step to um, hopefully having a greater amount of in positive influence over the industry in this yeah. way. Now, the uh, next one I really am not happy about on multiple levels. Uh, so first off, it just drives me nuts that people continually use AI. It's not AI, it's machine learning, um, hands down. Second of all, uh, one of the things that I don't like about this is that um, essentially uh, they're doing this in a way that's designed to supersede uh, state and local rules on that and that's really not a good thing because especially in places like California where there are certain jurisdictions that have uh, there are certain jurisdictions that have uh, banned the use of these technologies in in certain um, law enforcement contexts uh, it really kind of takes away that those protections um, and so this one, I'm. This one is is definitely uh, one of the one of the areas where I, f I feel like we need more good people in who are who are educated and understand this stuff, who are are actually generating this policy instead of career politicians that have no idea what they're dealing with. So um, that one not so hot. Uh, and then. Um, Let's see, the third one on that list is uh, yet again, I mean, okay, like good luck. This one, this one, I, I just say good luck with that. Uh, essentially, um, for the third time in our stories here, uh, they have 
directed NIST to uh, come up with a way to determine whether something's a deep fake or not. Um, so I, I, I'm just thinking this week and next week, they're going to be having some very interesting meetings down at NIST with all these new uh, directives that they have to come up with. So um, yeah, this one sounds good on paper. Uh, we'll see where they get with it. Um, yeah. But I don't think it's just as easy and simple as saying, okay, you go take care of this nest and you figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've certainly got the trends there. And I tend to agree that the IoT is time to have rules. The rest of it's too new to even know what the rules should be yet. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And then we got Ubuntu. So this is a alternate to Chrome OS. Chrome, alternate to Chrome OS. Oh, this is like I used Gallium OS, which is similar. Yeah, yeah. So similar. So this runs Ubuntu, and it's Firefox instead of Chrome, and it has early or experimental Android app support. Uh, so it's kind of kind of like here. Put this on a Chromebook instead. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because I mm -hmm. have a bunch of Chromebooks and I wiped out the original Chromium and so I couldn't I had to put Gallium on it, which is based on Xubuntu. So this might be another alternative. Right. This could be another alternative for those folks who still have a uh, Chromebook with uh, Intel and can't run anything anymore. This could work. Yeah. You yeah. don't have a, a bill for ARM yet, but it looks like it's coming. Yeah, uh, are, are Chromebooks ARM? I guess they're not. I don't. Some really are. Know. Yeah, some okay. are, but most are not. Okay, good. Uh, anything else? Well, no. I'll, stop, I'll stop this recording.